Hello, Woodstock congregation. This is Harold Savage from the Snellville congregation over here on the east side of Atlanta. And I hope this lesson, this video finds you well, that you're taking care of yourselves, that God's continuing to bless you. I know he's doing that with the Woodstock congregation. You're a light to the world around you and that you will uh, keep moving forward in these um, somewhat challenging and difficult days that God is using you in a great way. Thank you for uh, inviting me to be a part of your study, an ongoing study about not only the deeds of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit. And I am uh, tasked tonight with uh, an assignment of the, uh, the flesh. And I want to read to you from Galatians chapter 5, your text that you have chosen for this study, um, just to, again, um, introduce our topic and then launch into my assignment. This is what Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and following. He says, but I say to you, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets itself uh, or its desires against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. They are immorality and impurity and sensuality and idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you. Just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the walking in the spirit, first of all, means that you're a Christian, that you're born again, and you've been born again by the spirit. You've identified with that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and you were a child of God. And if you're a child of God, you have the spirit, Christ in you, the hope of glory. No wonder we're reminded that we're never alone. God promised us that he would never leave us and never forsake us. We don't have to carry Jesus with us or wait for him to arrive. He's right here with us, the Spirit of God in each of our lives. So first of all, it means you're a child of God. Also, it means that you're susceptible, that you uh, are open and sensitive to the influence of the Spirit in your life. You want God in your life. You want Him to be number one. You want Him to control your activities and your language and and your personality or the, just how uh, God molds you and makes you. You want that in your life. And then thirdly, you are a student of the Word of God. And as a student of God's word, you're reading uh, his word. And you, as you read it, James says you're looking into a mirror and you want to remember uh, the changes that need to be made because God, through his Holy Spirit, is molding you to be more like Christ. And that really is the work of the Spirit in the revelation of being more like uh, Christ. The Holy Spirit wants to mold us and to make us to look like Jesus. That's what we want to look like. In fact, he tells us, Jesus does, that the mission of the Holy Spirit is exactly that. When you read John chapter 14, 15, and 16, he's uh, talking about what the Spirit does in promoting him. The Spirit uh, is causing us, it is helping us, it is molding us um, through his word to be made more like him. The Bible here said, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So there's no way that you're going to act on fleshly desires if you're walking in the, in the Spirit. Um, the two simply do not go together. The Holy Spirit is not going to move to gratify your desires and passions. Uh, in fact, the key to righteous living is to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit, and not under the domination, as Paul is telling us here, in the book of Galatians, not under the law. Walking in the Spirit is it is the key to righteous living, but it's not easy. Uh, I, I want to remind you that right here at the very beginning that there is a war going on. We need to be reminded, we should be 
when we turn on the news, we ought to be reminded that there's a war going on. Uh, Paul told us in Ephesians 6, man, you need to put on the full armor of God. You are in a battle with Satan. But not only are we in this external battle with Satan every day, we are also with uh, within us, uh, taking place within us is this battle. Um, in fact, what Paul says here is that the spirit and the flesh they don't go together. They're in opposition to one another. They're contrary to one another. And when you have two things inside of you that are contrary or in opposition, they are going to be fighting all the time. Your flesh and the spirit are at war with one another. And um, I don't want to discourage you, but it's going to take place until you get your new body in heaven and you find yourself in glory. It's just not going to go uh, away. And the way you fight the flesh is by walking and living in the spirit. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6 and verse 6 that the old man, the old self, has been crucified. It's been done away with. But that doesn't keep that flesh, those old habits, that desire that's there um, from um, battling against us every day and we'll have that battle i think until uh until we meet him face to face in in glory it says if you're led by the spirit you're not under the law and so this is the antidote if you will to the flesh it's not found in the law it's found under uh or living in the spirit it also says the work of the uh, here in galatians 5 it says that the works of the flesh they're evident. Now, Paul's just written about this battle that's taking place. It's not It's not a battle that can be seen necessarily. It's a battle that's taking place in our hearts and our minds um, within us. It's an interior battle. But what happens is when we give into the flesh, it is seen visibly uh, in our life. It's almost as though Paul is embarrassed to say, do I have to name these things? You guys obviously know these things, but being led by the Holy Spirit, writing these things, he became specific about those things that uh, that uh, come out of um, the flesh. And so as he's specific, he tells us, um, here are some things that are going to be evident um, works of the flesh. Now, my assignment uh, today is when we come to this list in particular to speak about two things that most people today really don't think they have a problem with. People today say, hey, this is a long time ago. This isn't bothering me today. This is, you know, maybe some of these other things on this list. Um, but I want to show you in this lesson that all of us, and I mean every one of us, struggle with the two things that I'm going to speak about tonight and that is idolatry and sorcery. You will see them in uh, verse 20, the beginning of verse 20 in Ephesians chapter 5. And you're saying, now, Harold, I'm not an idol worshiper, and I don't have anything to do with witchcraft, which, by the way, that same word is uh, rendered or translated in the NIV as witchcraft. You're saying, Harold, I'm not involved in any of that. But I promise if you'll hear me out, and uh, as we study this lesson together, you'll see that we have uh, a lot more struggles with these two things than we really want uh, to, um, well, that we really want to to uh, to admit to. So, uh, so what about idolatry? Well, just right off, idolatry, you know, is anything that usurps the authority of God in your life that dethrones God. It's the worship of any God except the God revealed in the Bible, the Maker and the Sustainer. Uh, of all things. People over the years have said, hey, listen, I, I can have my opinion um, about these things. My, my um, you know, God of their opinion or the God of uh, creation, um, they can reject uh, the living and true God. And that's true. Um, people have said, you know, I can believe whatever I want to believe, but there are consequences to that. And I'll show you that in Romans 1 a little later. When you reject the Creator for those things that He's created, um, it creates a problem. There are consequences that go along with that. So right off, I want to tell you that when you're walking in the Spirit, when you're living in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit never leads anyone to idolatry. And secondly, sorcery or the idea of witchcraft 
Um, and it, it really, we're talking about two things that have to do with the worship of God. These are religious sins, if you will. And this in particular has to do um, with the worship of the occult or the spiritual powers apart from the true God. In the original language, Paul uses a word, uh, pharmakia, and you probably already know that's where we get our word pharmacy or pharmaceutical from. So it has to do with the idea of drugs, if you will, or medicines, um, generally speaking, good or bad, depending on how it's used or the context and how it's used. But the word there, pharmakia, is the word that's rendered sorcery or uh, witchcraft. Morris defines this word, and I quote, the use of any kinds of drugs, potions, or spells. William Barclay said this, he said this literally means the use of drugs. It came to be very specifically connected with the use of drugs or sorcery of which the ancient world was full. So the Holy Spirit will never lead you. If you're walking in the Spirit, he will never leave you, lead you toward this kind of light, sorcery, or you having to put inside of your body something that will take away from the confrontation of the changes that you really need to make in your life. So as we examine these uh, a little bit closer here in the next few minutes, I think you'll see that these are not as far removed from us as we would like to think uh, they are. So first of all, idolatry. Now in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 1, uh, the Apostle Paul spoke about uh, this um, this problem of idolatry. And by the way, idolatry is condemned in the Old Testament, the New Testament. Um, and um, But I want to read to you, okay, Romans chapter, this is Romans 1, verses 18 and following. It said, the Bible says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress uh, the truth and righteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God has made it evident for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that we are, you are without excuse. Now, let me just stop right here and say what Paul is saying uh, to the church here at Rome is the Gentile world has no excuse not to believe in a God that from the very beginning, the very things that God created, you should see it, the, the, the attributes of God in those things that he's created. In other words, as you look around the world, there has to be so much design that you, you would come to the conclusion there is a designer, that there is a, a pattern uh, to everything, that it, this wasn't just happened, it wasn't an accident, that this was intentional, that in order to have so much creation, there has to be a creator. And he says to the Gentile world here at the beginning of Romans, you are without excuse. Later on, he's going to say to the Jewish folks, hey, listen, you had the law and you were without excuse. And then he would combine both of those and say the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So he tells all groups of people, listen, you're without excuse. You should have known you had the law or you should have been able to look around and know that because of creation, there is a creator. But listen what he goes on to say. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was dark. And professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image of the form of the corruptible man, of the birds and the four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over to the lust of their hearts, to the impurity of their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. So Paul tells us that in the process, mankind looking for something or someone to worship instead of worshiping the creator ends up worshiping those things that God created. And there's really a sense in which, you know, here God, he's the giver, James tells us, of every good gift. So he gives us these material blessings in, in life. He gives us opportunities. He gives us talents. 
in some of the very gifts, and it shows you how devious Satan is because he can take something good and actually turn them around uh, to make them uh, bad. And so you, you can take a talent and you can take a gift, you can take a material thing, and depending on your, uh, your devotion to that thing or person, uh, you, can, you can use it in a wrong way. You can take the creation and serve and worship that rather than the creator. That's what Paul's saying in Romans uh, chapter 1. But not only is idolatry the adoration or the adoring, uh, the worship of, of images, something other than the worship of God, but Paul in Ephesians and Colossians says that it's covetousness. Idolatry is also covetousness. And what he means by that is it's the wanting material things. It's the material things that uh, the desire for material things that replaces our desire uh, to, uh, to know God, the one true living God. You know, our hearts are such that um, they go after or they're drawn to whatever our treasure is. Where your treasure is, Jesus said, there your heart will be also in Matthew 6 and verse 21. So if our treasure is earthly things and our devotion becomes towards, say, earthly things, then certainly that's where our heart is going to be. It's going to be drawn away from God. But not only that, Jesus told us in Matthew 6 in verse 24, you can't serve both God and mammon. You can't have uh, both uh, and serve both. You can't serve God and material things. So this means that you can take good things and make idols of them, um, a job or a house or a talent or a family or a hobby. You can take something good, something that God wants you to have and make a God uh, out of it. So the word idolatry is actually made up of, uh, it's two words. It's a compound word made up of two words, two Greek words. And the first word we get idol from is this idea of a man-made God, a pagan statue, um, if you will, a heathen uh, edifice of some kind. And so um, it's an image of a, of a false God. You, you know the story. I hope you know the story. It's a great story, and it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 5. But in 1 Samuel chapter 5, remember the Philistines, they capture the Ark of the Covenant. Remember the Ark of the Covenant represents the, the presence of God, it was in the camp of Israel. It stayed in the center of the camp. But when uh, they began to move across the Jordan, remember, they put it out in front of them. But it represented the presence of God. The Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant, and they set it up uh, on a ledge, if you will, in the presence of one of their gods, um, Dagon. And when they come back the next day, they see that Dagon, while the Ark of the Covenant is still sitting on its ledge, um, Dagon uh, has fallen on the ground. And so they pick uh, their god up, Dagon up, standing apparently back up. And when they come back the next day, not only is Dagon face down on the ground, but his head has been cut off and his hands have been cut off. If that isn't any example of how... Um, uh, God will not uh, share space uh, with a false God. I don't know. I don't know what is, but it's just such a great story there in the Old Testament. So th the word where we get the word idol from uh, in this idea of idolatry, the first part of this word, it is talking about a pagan, uh, a, a pagan idol or a pagan God. But the second part of this uh, compound word. Um, is electro, which is where we get the idea of service from. It's derived uh, from a word uh, that is um, talking about extreme devotion, like a priest in the temple, a good way of saying this, it would be a priest in the temple serving, being devoted to serving in the temple of the Lord. So it's the idea of someone fulfilling a great, uh, a great service. In Romans 1, in verse 9, Paul said, for God is my witness whom I serve in my spirit. The word serve is that same word, latru. Um, we get the word, that this idea 
of devotion. Paul saying, I'm serving God with this great devotion. Um, I'm, I'm giving my all. When Paul talked about serving, he was talking about giving his best efforts, his best work, his undivided uh, attention, if you will. And that's how Paul viewed uh, the worship and the service uh, to God. In Romans chapter 12, you know these verses in verse 1. Same word, latru, used again. This time Paul wrote, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That word, reasonable service, is that word that I'm speaking about here, the word latru. And it implies that our reasonable service to God, because of all that he has done for us, is that we serve him and that we give him our undivided attention. So when Paul says we're going to yield our bodies a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service, he's emphatically telling us that what we owe God is our best service, our best effort, our most complete and undivided attention as we uh, serve him. So when you attach these words together, okay, the idea of a false image, a false God, and the idea of devotion or service. You put them together, what you have is someone giving their, their best efforts, their, their um, devotion, and their undivided attention to something other than God. Are you following me? It is this idea of, of idolatry is something other than God has taken first places a uh, first place in a person's mind. And he is, when that happens, he's in, in a really into some measure into idolatry. It can happen uh, with our children or our parents and, you know, a job or um, a dream or a vision or a profession or possessions or a school, even church work can become, if we're not careful, uh, an, an idol. Our own talents uh, it's sometimes can unintentionally uh, become a focus of our worship and service. So it begs a few questions, okay, that I want to ask you. And you don't have to uh, answer these out loud. Just answer them in your heart. But um, but I think it begs a few questions, all right? Number one, um, what do you think about more than anything else? What do you think about more than anything else? What consumes your thoughts when you get up in the morning, what are you thinking about? What consumes your thoughts? What do you live for? What is it? What, is, what are you passionate about? What is it that you're living for today? Listen, you may not have a carved stone statue in your living room, but you very well could have something in your life that has usurped or taken the place of God. It is maybe a hobby. Maybe it's something that's taken you uh, away and you have devoted your life and your talent and your service to that thing instead of your devotion uh, to God. So, um, so I think these are, these are good questions uh, to ask. I, I, I'd sure hate for God to get our attention like he got the Philistines' attention with Dagon. But I do think he has a way of reminding us uh, that there are consequences when we take on uh, serving and worshiping the creation rather than uh, the creator. Jesus said, seek first my kingdom, seek first my kingdom and, and my righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. Make Jesus the primary focus of your life. And he, and he says, in fact, if you'll do that, all these things will be added unto you, even where our family is concerned and, and uh, our, our hobbies or whatever material things that we might have. Uh, seek him first in all your life, and then he'll add all of these things that you need un, uh, to him. God will make sure you've got everything that you need. Uh, not all your greeds, but I think God takes care of all of our needs Make sure that he has first place in your life. Wouldn't we be a different world if people woke up in the morning saying, how can I serve the Lord instead of how can I serve myself? 
they woke up in the morning saying, how can I serve my fellow man? And how can I lead others to Christ rather than how can I get people to serve me? How can I manipulate the situation and the circumstances today? We would be a different world if we woke up reminding ourselves that God is on the throne of our life and that we need to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. That's the problem, isn't it? With a living sacrifice, we keep crawling off the altar. And uh, so it, uh, we've got to keep get putting ourselves back on the altar and saying, Lord, here I am. Use me today. Um, I want to serve you. I want you. I want to give you the best efforts of my life and uh, be devoted to you. All right. I know there's more to say about this, but I need to move on to the second thing. And that's the this idea of witchcraft or sorcery or magic. Pharmakia is the word that I mentioned earlier. And it's used in three ways. It's used in a good way, a positive way. Um, you know, the use of drugs with no bad meaning. It's used uh, as a poison, you know, that uh, with no cure. And then, of course, um, it's used in this idea of sorcery and witchcraft. And it's often used talking about either casting spells or altering the behavior of others. And I think this is really what Paul is, is touching on because of what's going on. It's condemned, by the way, in the Old Testament, Exodus 22 and verse 18. And it's condemned in the New Testament in Revelation 21 and verse 8. If you know the book of Acts, you know that there's a great story in Acts chapter 21. Remember where there's the preaching of the gospel and people are so convicted that they're in the process of repenting and changing their lives that they take all of their magic books and they burn them. What a great example of how God takes over your life and they were willing to just give up all of that. Um, uh, that's Acts 19, by the way, in verses 18 uh, through through 20. So the idea, this Greek word, um, it's used in co connection with something that alters uh, your behavior. Now, when the Church of Jesus Christ was being established in the first century, paganism uh, ruled the Roman Empire. And you talk about a dark time. You know, a lot of their temple worship uh, had to do with orgies, and a lot of their temple worship had to do uh, with altering someone's mind with a, a hallucinogenic, uh, alcoholic, or drug-induced um, uh, potion. And so what the heathen worshipers would do is they would come to these pagan temples, they would come sick, or they would come with uh, um, disappointment or despair, they would come with some kind of weight on them and they would come wanting some answers and some relief. And what these priests in these uh, pagan temples would do is they poured and mixed these uh, hallucinogenic drugs and they gave them to the people that would come and worship in these temples. So uh, the priests would send them home and for at least a, a small amount of time, they would think their problems were gone and they would feel a little bit better. The only problem is, is what these, uh, these pagan worshipers found out was that their problems returned again and again and again. And so they would go, have to go back to the temple. They would take these, uh, the, take these potions and they would find, uh, if you will, temporary re relief. Um, and it would offer absolutely no permanent uh, solution. So uh, the, the flesh kind of behaves the way these pagan priests do in, in the same, uh, same way. And, and um, you know, it, it, the flesh doesn't fix itself. In fact, it doesn't want to. It wants to feed uh, on, uh, on more fleshly things. Um, so the flesh it wants to ignore the problem. It, the flesh doesn't want to confront the problem and change the problem. It wants it to go away. And um, that's what a lot of people do today, don't they? Uh, they have problems. They may not go to a pagan temple, but they go to a liquor store, and which, by the way, was strange. They were essential. Liquor stores were essential and stayed open during the pandemic. I was not essential, but a liquor store was. Um, anyway, they would go to a liquor store and uh, buy whatever um, potions they need to mix 
uh, to make them temporarily forget about their problem. Same with recreational drugs and, and so forth. But people do it in other ways. Instead of confronting our problems, we, um, we uh, uh, turn to maybe, you know, becoming a shopaholic. You know, we go out and buy things that we don't need with money we don't have. Um, some people turn to pornography. It, it takes their mind temporarily off their surroundings. And, but with all of these things, just like those pagan worshipers in the temple, eventually you sober up. Eventually, whatever temporary high disappears, you're left with whatever problem you had in the very beginning. And that's what the flesh does. The flesh doesn't want you to see the problem. You know, James, the Bible says in the, in the book of James, tells us that we need to look into the word of God. We need to look into it intently and see the changes that we need to make in our life. The flesh doesn't want you to make changes. God wants you to make changes. And so James tells us, don't, don't be a forgetful uh, here. Be an effectual doer. Don't walk away forgetting the changes that you need to make in your life. And by the way, I've got some that I need to make, and you've got some that you need to make. And that war that's taking place inside of us, it really does matter which side we feed by the word of God and by what we do. And because whichever one is going to grow stronger is the one that's going to be winning these battles. And so um, the, the flesh doesn't want us to slow down long enough. It'll keep us busy with work. It'll keep us busy with recreation. It'll keep us busy uh, with uh, watching television, uh, binge watching our shows on television, whatever it is. It'll just keep us busy or preoccupied. But eventually we come back to being confronted that we have a problem. Now, listen, I'm not giving medical advice. I'm not a doctor, even though I did stay at a Holiday Inn. I don't want to give you medical advice, but I do want to give you spiritual advice, all right? So if your do doctor told you to take some medicine and uh, you need to take that medicine, then please take that medicine. But the spiritual advice that I'd like to give you is don't let your flesh tell you um, that you can keep covering up your problems uh, with something that may be just a temporary solution. Uh, temporary solutions, whatever they are, eventually, eventually wear off. They run out. And uh, when they do, the same old person resurfaces. The same old problems resurface. So the Holy Spirit wants to identify the root of our problems. And it wants to rip. It wants to cut that ugly thing. Uh, right, Alan, just like a doctor wants to remove whatever cancer they find in your body so it doesn't spread. The Holy Spirit wants to take away whatever it is you find when you look into that mirror so that you can live walking in the spirit and living a life that God not only would be pleased with, but that would last um, and give you some permanent change in your in your life. So look into God's word. Spend time reading and studying and meditating on God's word to see not only the things that are wrong, but also the path that is right that you need to take in your life. So our purpose, if you will, in today's world of sorcery um, from this Greek word pharmakia um, is, is maybe more to refer to our attempts to either confront and change or to continue to ignore whatever problems are going on in our life. So maybe it's time for you to um, stop playing games with the very things that you have allowed into your home, into your mind, and maybe even into the habits of your life, that as you confront those, as God through his word and the Holy Spirit convicts you of these things, then you need to ask him to help you, um, to help you live the kind of life that you want to live and that the only thing that will have control over you is the word of God and the power of God and the Holy Spirit uh, of God. And maybe there is something that's taken the place of God in your life. You know, some idol, it's not a statue in your living room, even though it may be. Uh, may not be necessarily a horoscope or something like that. 
but you have allowed a hobby or a recreation or maybe even a God-given talent that you have, that you have poured all of your devotion and your best efforts into that and in the process have replaced uh, God with those things. And when you do, uh, you'll see the consequences eventually. So let's make him first place in our life. Seek first his kingdom. Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And maybe the best time to do that is, is right now. Um, you don't have to walk down an aisle. You don't have to call a preacher and confess your sins. But you could, in the privacy of your own home, bow your head and do some serious praying and ask God to help you get some things right in your life spiritually. And when you walk by the Spirit and you live by the Spirit, oh, listen, um, the battle's not going to go away, but it will be so much better. I believe in God's grace, His goodness, His forgiveness in our life. Listen, you've messed up. I've messed up. He sees the very best in us, not what we've done, but what we can do. Um, our best days are in front of us. They're not behind us. God loves you. He's not going to give up on you because you've made some mistakes or sinned in your life. He died showing, demonstrating his love for you, and he will never give up on you. And as I said at the very beginning of this lesson, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Woodstock, God bless you. Watch over, look after each other, love each other, serve each other. Be a light to a lost community around you. God bless you.